Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It's pretty hard to believe it's 4.30 and it's dark outside, so I'm just looking all out at you and absorbing the darkness already. But I'm glad to see a full room of people here. I'm Tom Lanning, the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. The McFarland Center sponsors lect lectures, conferences, exhibits, all sorts of special events that foster dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You can find more about our programs online and watch past programs at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center, where in a couple of days uh, your friends will be able to see this talk if you go back and tell them what they missed. So uh, today I'm really pleased to welcome a Holy Cross alumnus, uh, Tom White, who is a member of the class of 1969. He's going to speak on dolphins, captivity, and the challenge of interspecies ethics. Last June, I was giving a talk to the great class of 1963 at Holy Cross, their 55th uh, reunion, and a member of the class, a man from California named Frank Handler, came up to me afterwards, and he was convinced there was a guy I needed to bring out from California to talk about a topic on dolphins and on ethics, and he kind of made a case for me about that. I admired his work and had heard him when Tom was on the board of a uh, um, uh, marine mammal uh, institute in California, uh, 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 Frank was. We, neither of us knew until I looked into it a little bit more and we talked about it that the man who Frank admired so much turned out himself to be a Holy Cross alumnus. Uh, Tom White's work, as I've come to learn, has transformed the way that many of us think about dolphins and the obligations we have to them. It's impacted work of scientific symposia and led to an international conference on the protection of cetaceans, of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. As I suspect he'll share a little bit more in depth, he came to this work in an indirect way, quite unintentionally. He's an ethicist, having received a PhD from Columbia University after he graduated from Holy Cross, and he taught primarily in business ethics. He held the inaugural Conrad N. Hilton Chair in Business Ethics, and he directed the Center for Ethics at, and Business at Loyola Marymount University. He is founder and director of the International Business Ethics Case Competition. And recently, when he moved back from LMU, as it turned out, uh, to Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, he's been teaching at Mount Holyoke College. For all those accomplishments, Professor White's research for many years has been on the ethical implications of scientific research on dolphins. In 2007, he published a book called In Defense of Dolphins, The New, Natural, the New, New Moral Frontier, which argues that dolphins are self-aware, intelligent beings who should be regarded as non-human persons. We can talk about what that would mean to be a non-human person, and valued as individuals. Recently, he's been thinking beyond that, looking at what a capabilities approach to ethics, how that can help us think about our responsibility to cetacean flourishing. He's one of the authors of the Declaration of Rights for Cetaceans, Whales and Dolphins, and has contributed to a number of journals and edited volumes. He's a scientific advisor to the Wild Dolphin Project and a fellow at the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. He served as a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations 2007-2008 Year of the Dolphin Program. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tom White. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Uh, as Tom said, I graduated in 1969. Uh, I have not been on campus since sometime in the early 70s. It looks just the same, by the way. This is really, uh, uh, it's really a thrill to be back. Uh, despite the fact that I have not been on campus in that, uh, in that stretch of time, um, I have, of course, felt great connection with the college through all that time. One of the most interesting ways has to do with the fact that this is my copy of Thomas More's Utopia, which I used in my junior year Renaissance prose course that was taught by Tom Lawler. I don't know if he's still, I think he's still around in some way, which I took just because it kind of sounded interesting. Now, the interesting part of this is that because Thomas More's Utopia turned out to be more than just sort of interesting to me, when I then uh, went to Columbia, I signed up for a course in Renaissance philosophy taught by Paul Oscar Christeller, the great Renaissance scholar, and started working with him and that then determined the next 20, 25 years of my academic career, which I specialized in uh, 16th century Renaissance humanism and wrote on Thomas More, Erasmus of Rotterdam, and More's Utopia. That was my first academic career. I then shifted gears and did contemporary applied ethics, did business ethics, and worked on dolphins. But in a way, most interesting is that I've been teaching a course on utopian theory at Mount Holyoke this semester, 
And I have once again reached for my original copy of Moore's Utopia and working some, with some of my class notes out of that. So part of the story is at a college like Holy Cross, where you take a class that just, oh, gee, maybe this is interesting, you never know the way in which it may have a major impact on your life. So interesting story, at least for me. Uh, as Tom mentioned, main work I've been doing certainly in the last 30 years has to do with the philosophical implications of the scientific work on dolphins, especially the ethical implications. Now when I first got into this work, the most pressing ethical problem had to do with the deaths of dolphins in connection with tuna fishing. When you go to the grocery store or you buy tuna, now you regularly see the dolphin safe label. At the time when I started getting into this, that was not the case. And hundreds of thousands of dolphins were dying in connection with a particular kind of uh, fishing that was being done. And so there was great uproar about that as being unethical. That issue has come and gone. There are still deaths in connection with tuna fishing, too many. There are deaths in connection with bycatch, you know, other fishing practices. But the, the ethical issue that has gotten more attention, and you're probably much more aware of, is the issue of captivity, particularly at companies like SeaWorld. And so more of my uh, attention in the last 10 years certainly has been sort of tilting in that direction around the question, is captivity ethically defensible? I've looked at this from a couple of angles. As Tom mentioned, I've been teaching at the business school at Loyola Marymount, so there are fundamental business ethics issues there. There are also issues that are very specifically related to non-human animals, and what are the ethical issues there. What I'm going to do today is to talk about the basic issue, as I, as I see it, in terms of the fundamental challenge of interspecies ethics. Interspecies, in this regard, humans and dolphins, and that of the issue of captivity. I'm going to offer two arguments for why I think that captivity is not ethically defensible. One which Tom alluded to, the question of personhood. And this is, is, is outlined in most detail in my book, In Defense of Dolphins. But I always felt there were some limitations to that. And in the last few years, I've been working to kind of overcome that. And the second argument, which I'm going to be offering in connection with that, is around the concept of flourishing. And that's going to be sort of the heart of the talk. I'm also, though, various points going to be bringing up some issues related to anthropocentrism or species bias. That is, trying to find ways to talk about the questions we're looking at, overcoming, if not explicit, at least implicit ways in which we look at a problem, we think we're being neutral, but we aren't. And that then biases the outcome. And then I'm going to, I'll conclude with some short comments about what I see as part of why we have the problem that we do. That is, some weaknesses in the way that scientists, philosophers, and executives, weaknesses in the way they typically approach ethical issues related to cetaceans. So that's kind of an overview of what I'm going to do. But I think what we should do is start with a quick run through about, about dolphins. So dolphins are a small toothed whale, cetaceans, whales, and whether it's uh, the small dolphins or orcas, they're all dolphins. Orcas are just the biggest member of the dolphin family. Dolphins are mammals. They're animals. Uh, to be a mammal, all that means is you breathe air, you're warm-blooded, young are born alive, they're suckled with mammary glands, and you have hair. Yes, dolphins have hair. When you're born, there are a few hair follicles. That's all it takes. But they are indeed, they do indeed have hair. But they're mammals just as we are. This is what the common ancestor of all whales and dolphins looked like about 50, 60 million years ago before they went back to the land. They were, you know, animal, you know they were quadrupeds. The time on the planet between you know, our history and theirs is important to note. Cetacea have been on the planet about 50 to 60 million years. They, the modern dolphin, for example, if you go to the Cape, if you look out in the ocean, you see dolphins in the, in the water, that model design or whatever you want to talk about, that's about 15 million years old. 
humans have been on the planet three, four million years ago. Our version of Homo sapiens, as it were, we're talking about something in the ballpark of 100,000 years. Theirs is a much older species, a much older design. It's simply important to appreciate differences in, in our species. Theirs is much older than we are. OK, they went back to the ocean from the land. If you spent any time in the ocean, especially if you dive at all, you know light goes really fast. Also, if you know anything about the ocean, it's much more active at night. That means if you're going to live in the ocean, you have to be able to work in the dark. And you have to be able to work very effectively in the dark, because if you want to feed, you're going to be able to feed better at night than during the day. It's simply going to be a matter of the adaptation that you have to make. How do dolphins do that? They do it with a sound, with a sense that we don't have, or at least a version of hearing that is dramatically better than ours. It's called echolocation. The way it works is that, and bats have it as well, the way it works is that dolphins generate sound in these air sacs. They send it out, and they use what's called a melon. It's like a lens. They can manipulate that to determine the wavelength and all. It goes out, it bounces off a target, it, the echoes go on back in, and they can read the echo. That works in the dark, that's how they make their way around. The echo comes back in through the bottom of the jaw, and in effect, they get three-dimensional pictures in their mind about what they see. OK, imagine that we are in, in a pool or in a body of water with a dolphin. And there is a box there that has an object in it. Would you know what's in the box? Would a dolphin know what's in the box? How do you think they'd, what do you think they'd think about us? For them, it's nothing to look into the box. Not only could they know what's in it, if it were, say, something organic, they would not only know what it was, they could know every detail of it. It was though they could take an x-ray of that. If it were an object that had printing on the back side of it, they could read that printing. What could we know? We could know the outside, what the outside of, what one side of the box looked like. We could know this. Every now and then I wonder, I wonder what dolphins think of us. Because there are so many ways in which we think, wow, we're the top of the heap. And then you think of things that they can do that we can't. It's hard to imagine that they think that what we do in the water counts in any way as swimming. That's kind of the most obvious thing. But, so they have echolocation. This is the way that they make their way through the world. Dolphin life is highly social. It's really more social than, he, than, he, than human, than, than our life. No, that shouldn't be no surprise because when you live in the water, the most important tool you have for survival is the other members of your community. You can't build things, you can't build weapons, you can't build shelters. Your best bet, the best way to achieve a decent life is to be on good terms with your neighbors. So much of their day is spent, indeed, uh, affirming relationships with other members. And they have roles, they have rich, rich societies. Despite all the public relations about Flipper as this happy, playful being, Dolphins are aggressive. There should be no surprise about that. You can't be you know, an animal on the planet without having some element of aggression. Otherwise, you could not survive. And we're talking about beings that have survived for millions of years. For me, though, the most interesting thing about dolphin aggression is that it is restrained. Now, one of the most uh, fortunate things about my work that I've done is that uh, Denise Herzing, who um, terrific scientist who has now for 30, 35 years been studying a community of wild Atlantic spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. Long, terrific long-term non-invasive study. And uh, she has let me uh, you know, just sort of be on the, uh, the research boat basically either as ballast or shark bait. You know, I never know quite what I am, but she lets me observe the, the research. And so 
I've been in the water a lot observing dolphin social behavior. And so, you know, there's definitely a good bit of aggression that goes on. The most interesting thing, though, is how restrained it is. They're able to work out whatever it is that is a problem, and they don't, it doesn't escalate to the point where they kill one another. Now, from, an, from the standpoint of, again, what is the smart thing to do, the more that you let anger get to the point where you kill one another off, you're indeed decreasing the likelihood that your community is going to do well. So I'd like to think that over time, the kind of personality that got selected for was one that learned how to dial back the anger to the point that you learned how to manage the relationship. And one way that I think you could say that dolphin, that if there's a trait to dolphin intelligence, it has to do with the ability to manage relationships. But so two points on this. Yes, dolphins are aggressive, and sometimes their aggression is really serious. But we've never seen it, you know, at least in that community, escalate to the point where they end up killing one another. There's also a good bit of mutual curiosity between humans and dolphins, at least with some of the communities. For example, the uh, community that Denise is studying, they initiated contact with humans before even Denise started doing the research. This is an area in, uh, in the Bahamas where uh, there are a lot of, you know, over the years there have been a lot of wrecks, you know, ships that went down. And the way this particular community even started being studied is that you know, wreck divers were out there you know, doing salvage work. And these dolphins started coming out of curiosity. And Denise started hearing these stories of these wreck divers who were complaining about the dolphins who were pestering them. Seriously, this is the... And she signed on for one summer as a naturalist on one of the, one of the boats that you know, sort of worked that, that area. And she saw what was going on, and then she was able to sort of start you know, her own work trying to... Was, I think she was a grad student at the time, trying to get you know, money and resources together to do the research. But they initiated the contact. And one scientist I know, you know reflecting on, on this, that dolphins will occasionally do that, you know, he'll say, what other mammal do we know of that has gone out of its natural environment, out of curiosity, to make contact with some other animal? Well, humans have done that. Dolphins have done that. But I don't know anyone who's been able to... I mean, there, there may be others, but those are certainly two that show mutual curiosity about another intelligent species. Okay, so big, that's a big picture kind of, of dolphins. Let's move on to the first argument. The first argument that I'm going to offer for why captivity is not ethically defensible is because I'm going to argue dolphins are non-human persons. It's helpful then to know what it means if we say something is a person. And of course, what philosophers do is we make distinctions. That's the first thing philosophers do. So we're going to distinguish between the concept human and person. Human is a biological concept. All it takes to be a human is to be a member of our species. Person, though, is a philosophical concept. The, I, the goal in the distinction is that we want to have a term that is not locked into a biological definition, but rather we want a concept that simply identifies traits that we consider to be most critical here, that is the traits that entitle us to, to special treatment. And it doesn't matter what species it is. So if you're fans of uh, aliens from another planet or if you're fans of science fiction of one sort or another, the species doesn't matter. And it leaves open the possibility that if you come across you know, a species of one sort or another, it even opens, it leaves open the possibility that if you have a machine and you're able to talk about life in a certain way, you know, those, that then has the possibility of personhood, which raises interesting ethical issues. Okay, so what would it take to be a person? A standard, really strict definition would be something like this. A person would have to be alive, it would have to have the ability to be aware of its external environment. It would need to 
be able to experience pleasure and pain in a positive and negative sensations, have emotions, to have self-consciousness, to have some kind of personality, to be able that its personality is strong enough that it could control its behavior, that it recognizes and treats other persons appropriately, that it has a series of higher order cognitive abilities, such as abstract thought, the ability to learn, the ability to solve complex problems, and to communicate in a way that suggests thought. Now notice that as we go down the list, they become more sophisticated. And these are things that humans have, which is one of the reasons that we consider ourselves to be persons. But as we go down the list, we see a greater degree of intellectual and affective sophistication. Claim is, and the claim I'm making is that you put all those things together, you get a being of intellectual and emotional sophistication, which has an individual sense of awareness and consciousness. It can control its own life. That's why we hold beings like that responsible. Those why, that's why we say beings like that are a who, not a what. There is a good bit of scientific, scientific evidence that I would say qualifies dolphins for those traits. Good deal of research on the dolphin brain by Laurie Marino. I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail in a minute. Capacity for self-awareness, critical uh, for personhood. Also, there's research on that. The ability to solve problems by planning. Now, when I say planning, I mean not by trial and error, but there's research that shows that dolphins could scope out a problem, determine a strategy, implement the strategy, and solve the problem. So all the thinking is done then ahead of time. The ability to understand artificial human languages. Dolphins don't have vocal cords, so you couldn't exactly do, do human language, but artificial human languages, interesting research there. The use of tools, not, natural, not artificial tools, but natural tools in their world. Social intelligence. Now, as I said, dolphins are more social than humans are. Good deal of evidence about the way that they are able to use their large brains to manage their, their roles in their societies. They're cultural. Now, when we talk about culture, we're talking about, for example, passing down norms and skills from one generation to the next. And we see that, we see it in sperm whales, we see it in, in orcas, we see that in, uh, in the smaller dolphins. And, as I, you know, again, what humans are most fond of, the idea of advanced intellectual skills. We see interesting ways that uh, hunting or gathering food is done. We see evidence that they are able to do syntax. Syntax is the property of a language whereby uh, the meaning of the sentence uh, changes depending upon the word order. So man bites dog is different from dog bites man, and we know that, you know, if you get that, it's because you understand syntax. Dolphins, I think sea lions do that as well, and, and some other uh, animals. They, re they understand representations of reality. That is the difference between reality and an image of a reality. They get the difference. They understand pointing and gazing, as opposed, for example, with um, with some animals, you know, if I were to point at something, all they do is figure out that, I, you know, it, it's my finger that is the important thing. And with human children, at a certain, you know, the, the distance that they get between the pointing and what the object is that they're supposed to pay attention to, that gradually grows. So we're talking about a significant brain operation here. Dolphins get that as well. Some more detail about the dolphin brain. Laurie Marino, who is hands down the world's best person on the dolphin brain, says they possess the neurological goods which underlie complex intelligence. She points out to the large brain. Dolphin brain is larger than the human brain, different structure, different, uh, different history, but particularly relative to the size of the body. It's big. It has an expanded neocortex, particularly in areas of higher order processing. And the tissue is such of the sort that typically supports higher order uh, processing and a sophisticated cell architecture. Uh, there aren't a lot of, uh, sort of numerical measures we can use, but one that is especially interesting, it's called encephalization quotient. It's the ratio of the weight of the brain to the weight of the body, and there's some uh, relationship uh, between that and the behavioral complexity 
and cognitive capacity. Now notice that what we have is that uh, whether humans, the humans and dolphins are up in this area, 7 to 4.6, everything else is significantly lower. So dolphins and humans are up in that, in that range. The most recent discovery has to do with what are called spindle cells, or von Economo neurons. These are certainly in humans, in dolphins, they've also been found in, some, uh, in elephants and some other non-human animals. They seem to be associated with social awareness, self-awareness, and things like empathy, guilt, embarrassment, love, obviously what we might call social intelligence, again, sophisticated intellectual and emotional, um, uh, cognitive and emotional uh, sophistication. Now, sense of self is, for me, one of the most important things you'd, you want to have if you're talking about personhood, and certainly in terms of determining what counts as ethically appropriate behavior towards a being. Because having a sense of self gives you a rich inner life. Now, it's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it lets you reflect about who you are. It lets you retrieve data. It lets you solve problems. It's like you have this inner workbench. You can retrieve data. You can analyze problems. You can reflect in the past what worked, what didn't work. In terms of personal history, you can pull out memories. You can think into the future. It gives you a very rich inner world. At the same time, it makes you vulnerable. It makes you vulnerable to grief. It makes you vulnerable to, bad, to sad memories. It makes you vulnerable to dread about the future. So it's, there's an upside and there's a downside. But it's, def it's the thing that makes us individuals. It's the thing that makes each individual unique. We do not have, we do not share self-awareness with one another. It is, the, it is, for me, the critical property that makes us say we are autonomous individuals, and any other being that has that is also an autonomous individual. OK, so I'm going to show, run a, a short video that shows a dolphin looking into a mirror. Mirror self-recognition is one of the standard ways that we assess whether or not, certainly with, with, human, with human babies, whether or not we, we see self-awareness there. Now, this is part of a much longer, larger experiment. This is just one tiny clip. There's tons of other that shows that con quite conclusively. Dolphins, at least the dolphins in the study, recognize themselves in the, in the mirror. Definite evidence for self-awareness. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, that really you know, does it in that way. Plenty of evidence, then, that we can say dolphins are a person. They're a who, not a what. As I said, beings with an individual self-aware consciousness which means that they have moral standing as individuals. The critical application of this then to captivity is that individuals, self-aware persons, do not get, you, you can't treat them as property. You know, we went through this before about persons and property. No matter what species a person is, you can't own it from an ethical standpoint. So that's the personhood argument which seems good, but remember I said I was going to talk every now and then about some issues of anthropocentrism? The problem with this is that when you go back and you look at the criteria of personhood, it's just like looking at a mirror. You know, so this becomes a just like us criterion, and it's based on, very much on asking what are the similarities between another species and us? So. You look down at that, that list, we may as well just be describing ourselves. It's not a species neutral uh, list. When you look at, again, some of the things that are mentioned brain structure, self awareness, solving problems by planning. Oh, solving problems by planning. If you look at some of that research, which is fascinating, the devices that they construct 
are ones that you'd construct to have humans do it. They aren't things that dolphins typically do in and of themselves. Even the self-awareness stuff. Dolphins don't have mirrors in the natural world. Also, it's a visual test. Dolphins' primary sense is sound. Artificial human languages, now they communicate in some fashion, that is really significant. We don't see an analog between human language in dolphin life. But they still do really interesting, they do really well in this kind of research. The most important thing about all of this research is what we can say, how well they operate in a foreign cognitive environment. These skill, you know, these tests, this line of research, is not designed around how they actually operate in their world because we don't know how to do that. They do really well in research that we design for us. You know, it's like the kind of achievement that Helen Keller did. I mean, this is not their first, you know, normal way of doing things. Okay, so the problem then becomes, oh, one more, encephalization quotient which they do really well on. Okay, so this is a good number. If you back out body fat and some factors related to the fact that uh, gra gravity feels different in the, in the ocean, the numbers become a lot closer. It wasn't until relatively recently, as it were, you know, in the last 10 years, anyone thought to fact, you know, worry about that. You know, what's the difference between the land and the water in worrying about encephalization quotient? So what we need is a species neutral standard. We need something that lets us take into account the differences between species because looking through the lens of an alien species allows us to be more aware of critical differences, say, regarding intelligence and self. You know, we, it's understandable that we would do this, but we have a bad habit of assuming that what counts for us will count for other beings, and that the object of the game is to work in terms of similarities and not be open to differences. And while there are many different, many similarities between humans and dolphins, there are far more differences, and I think in many ways the differences are more important because, for example, I think that it's, it's plausible to say cetacean intelligence and human intelligence are very different things. It's not that one's better than the other, but that they are different. So, what I would propose is that the concept of flourishing is a more species-neutral ethical standard and also one that is richer for the kind of inquiry that you need to do in interspecies ethics. Now, flourishing is best argued by the philosopher Martha Nussbaum at the University of Chicago. Uh, classic way that she leads up to this, she says, each creature has a characteristic set of capabilities or capacities for functioning distinctive of that species. And those more rudimentary capacities need support from the material and social environment if the animal is to flourish in its characteristic way. Uh, the capabilities approach uh, is the way that Nussbaum talks about this. She talks about this in a number of her works. She ultimately grounds this in an Aristotelian approach. This is a biological approach to ethics. Work with the idea that, as we see in Aristotle and anyone else who works like that, beings have fundamental capacities, you know, capabilities. In order for those to be developed, you need an environment which supports that. In order to flourish, as she says, there are rudimentary capacities that need support from the material and social environment if an animal is to flourish in its characteristic way. So this now becomes the world of biology, the world of adaptation, and say, what then is it that needs to be the condition necessary? A more specific elaboration of what flourishing is, I would argue, flourishing is the full, healthy, physical and emotional growth and development of the traits, skills and dispositions that allow a being a reasonable opportunity to have a rudimentarily satisfying and successful life 
as a member of that species. This is simply all that we're talking about is what is it that a being needs in order to grow, develop in a full, healthy fashion? What does it need in order to flourish? Not, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's a, it's a more empirical notion, in, indeed, than, flourishing, that, than personhood, and it makes room for looking at the life of a species, no matter what that species is. In this case, I'm just talking about cetaceans. I'm just talking about dolphins, and I'm just talking about you know, small dolphins and orcas. You can, you, th this concept can be applied, as Nussbaum does, to a number of non-human persons, for the sake of this discussion, I'm just talking about I'm just talking about cetaceans. From an ethical from, an ethical, from the point of ethics, the significance is that I'd argue that failing to provide persons with the conditions necessary for flourishing can reasonably be labeled harm. In preventing someone from growing and developing in a healthy fashion, that can count as harm. If the harm is serious enough, it can rise to the level of cruelty. It's clear where I'm going on this. Obviously, I'm going to suggest that the kind of harm that is experienced by dolphins and orcas in captivity is going to not be har only harmful, it's going to rise to the level of cruelty. So, it's important to ask, just to sort of put a fine point on this, what determines the conditions necessary for flourishing? Where do they come from? Again, this is, we're just talking biology and evolution here, no matter which species it is. What are the conditions that determine what humans need for flourishing? We've got millions of years of evolution and adaptation that have determined that. For dolphins, the same thing. We've got, well, a longer period of time, 50, 60 million years of adaptation and evolution. Same deal. The end product is, is what, we, you know, what we're going to be looking at. But that's, there's been a process that's determined that. Let's start with an example of a an animal we know and love, us. You know, what does it take for humans to flourish? Interestingly, we have taken that notion, and the way we restate it is really about human rights. Anytime you see a list, whether it's the UN Declaration of Human Rights or anything else of that sort, really it's the conditions necessary for flourishing. Things like life, human health and safety, emotional health and safety, absence of pain and suffering, freedom of choice, education, the way we're treated, partner, um, family, friends, intimate partners, rest. This is what you see on most lists of human rights. This is also the conditions that humans need in order to flourish. Same deal. Rights, con necessary conditions for flourishing. Okay, what does it take for dolphins to flourish in their natural habitat? That's where you look to see what a being needs in order to flourish. What, does it need, what do they need in their natural habitat? Okay, they need physical safety, they need secure sources of food, they need social interaction, they have rich social lives. They need to learn social skills, social roles, survival skills. They need to be able to pass, learn and pass on their group's culture. They need an appropriate environment for developing the skills that they need, and they need to be able to move around. It's not rocket science. You look at what a community of small dolphins, you look at a community of orcas need, that's what they need. When we look at them in, their, in the wild, what do we see? Okay, a dolphin community's home range may be 100 to 400 square miles. Some dolphin communities travel, oh, some, the communities sometimes number in the hundreds. An orca pod may travel 100 miles a day. Orcas can dive to 100 to 200 meters when foraging. Orcas live their entire lives in matrilines. Now, that means you will have four generations. In an orca pod, the female is the dominant, you know, the dominant figure. So you may have like a grandmother, a mother, a daughter with their children, and the sons. They may live together. I mean, they will live together their entire lives, and they may not be separated each day for more than a few hours. They're incredibly tight. That's their, that's their life. Those are the conditions under which they, they flourish. Life expectancy for uh, dolphins in the wild is very different from that in captivity. Laurie Marino argues that chronic stress leads to immunosuppression and susceptibility to physical disease in marine mammals that impacts mortality rates. Captivity for orcas is catastrophic. 
most captive orcas do not survive past the age of 20 years. The natural average lifespan for male and female orcas is 29.2 and 50.2 years, respectively, with maximum longevity of 60 and 90 years, respectively. Captivity does not agree, even in terms of basic lifespan. So is flourishing possible in captivity? SeaWorld argues yes. The truth is that our killer whales are healthy and happy and thrive in our care. Denise Herzing argues captivity gives us only a shadow of a fully actuated dolphin in the wild. See, one of the reasons that's so important is that this is not just about lifespan. But if you know what a dolphin is like in the wild and you see what a dolphin is like in captivity, it's not an exaggeration for Denise to say what you see in captivity is nothing more than a shadow of what a dolphin is really like because you see a being that cannot flourish. You see a being that has not developed its abilities. You see a being that is probably boring. You see a being that is no doubt bored. You see a being that has not been able to develop its social skills. You see a being that is stunted. It is nothing more than a shadow of what it actually could be. Laurie says, the abundance of scientific evidence shows unequivocally that cetaceans cannot thrive in captivity. Now, the figure on the left is SeaWorld San Diego. This is a car, by the way, so you get some sense of just how big or how small those pools are. This is the uh, resident area for one community of orcas. This is the Salish Sea. This is the northwest corner of the United States. This is Canada. This is a large territory. This is the kind of area orcas need in order to flourish. This, is, this just cannot even compare. This is, what is, this is what allows for flourishing. This clearly cannot. Now, our last thing I want to point out, as I said, part of the problem, it seems to me, is that despite all the evidence that we have, which I think is clear, People like Laurie Marino think is clear. Hal Whitehead, who is a sperm whale scientist. And other, there are a number of scientists who are, think this is quite clear. But there are a number that are not. And there are a number of philosophers who don't think it's all that clear. The problem with, the, with philosophers, now I'm a philosopher. Philosophers are good and decent people. But we have weaknesses. Philosophy is too much, in this world of you know, animal ethics, as it were, Philosophy is too much of an armchair um, enterprise. Um, the funny thing about the kind of work I do is that when I, when I started doing this, I thought the most natural thing in the world was you started talking to scientists. And then you asked if you could watch their field work. I didn't know that nobody did that. I started reading scientific stuff and I asked scientists to tell me what to read and then I asked Denise if I could go you know on her boat and watch stuff I didn't know that I was unique in that regard uh, in fact even now uh, the only other philosopher I know who does this sort of thing uh, Kirsten uh, Kristen Andrews at York uh, does the sort of thing with I think gorillas is what she's studying so and it really does make a huge difference in your perspective now, it is expensive and it is time consuming. I basically put a hole in my resume for nine years while I went out on the, uh, Denise's boat every summer for like two to four weeks and just observed because I did not feel that I was in any position to write. You can't do this when you're a grad student. You can't do it when you're untenured. Uh, so there are lots of reasons. But there is, there is a way in which philosophy is too much of an armchair enterprise to do this kind of thing really well. And that's one of the reasons I think there's not a clear enough position among, too many, among more philosophers about why this is unacceptable. Scientists, as I said, there are a number of scientists who are great on, on, on this. But there are too many, particularly in the marine mammals uh, world, who are not uh, convinced about this. And the reason for that is that uh, science is a descriptive intellectual enterprise. Philosophy and ethics is a normative enterprise. It takes being taught, or you have to learn that it is a technical normative process 
and that takes getting used to. And most marine scientists don't do that. And it's nothing that they have a feel for, nor are they anxious to do that. And this is one of those things, if you're really going to do interdisciplinary work, you have to do it on both sides. And then there's the problem of um, executives, people who run corporations that, um, uh, that, that use captive cetaceans. Sadly, they are at the, top of, at, at the highest levels, they are not familiar enough with either the science or the philosophy, or if they are, they, it doesn't weigh heavily enough. Now, in the world of SeaWorld, that's made some bad business decisions as, way, made, as well as some bad ethical decisions. Uh, but the bottom line on, on all of this is that uh, for those of you who are interested in, in, in this kind of thing and would want to do some work on this on the future, this is in many ways a tall order. It's important work. But if you're going to do it seriously, you really do have to sort of do it all. I mean, you have to take the science very seriously. You have to take field work seriously. Uh, if you're a scientist, you know, you've got to, to do this really well. You have to sort of follow the lead of people like Laurie and Hal Whitehead and also sort of get into and really understand the philosophical side of things as well. Because as much as I've been able to, and I've been very fortunate in being able to, um, you know, sort of you know, add my voice to the, you know, to the trying to make things better, uh, people like, you know, Hal Whitehead, Laurie Marino, as I said, who are scientists, they get heard much, much better than I do because there's a way in which for a scientist to say, to be able to sort of do the philosophical vocabulary and say, yeah, this is wrong, people hear that better than, than if I do. And so especially those of you who have a scientific you know, inclination on this, I absolutely encourage you to, uh, to sort of take this seriously because this is all about making the world a, be a better place. And you know, people, you know, places like Holy Cross, it's about trying to make the world a better place and from my perspective, it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's for humans or for non-humans. It's about making the world a better place. Thank you. I try not to get into too, too much of the what are the obligations of one set onto another, just that when we see a clear case, let's take SeaWorld, when we see a clear case of persons being used as objects, as property, the management of that company has acted in a way that is ethically indefensible. For me, the easiest thing is to look at that. Well, this is a clear, clear business ethics case. And so the situation is that they have already crossed a line that they should not have crossed. And so their obligation is to find a way to redress that. You raise a good question. This kind of thing, I always try to keep it as narrow as possible. For example, the, the question always comes up about uh, um, what about, what about um, animals who are non-persons? And my position is, well, there are, there are many reasons to treat non-persons uh, non well. All I argue is, in the personhood argument, all I argue is that we know that dolphins are persons, and so they should not be treated as property. And well, no, that's 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 their world. You know, my feeling is that's their world. They navigate their own world. It's not our job to uh, to mess about in that. That's they already have. They've been in that world 50, 60 million years. I don't know, I don't know enough about the way that works. Um, now, occasionally, they, ha they will seek human help for, um, there are at least two cases you know, that I write about uh, you know, in, in defense of dolphins, where they actively seek out human help for, like, in, in each case it was getting like a hook removed. And there's a documentary uh, that came out about a year ago where um, the, uh, this whale that was wrapped up in fishing, a fishing net didn't actively seek out help, but cooperated with rescuers to, as they were trying to cut the net off. So in those cases, you figure, okay, you're getting consent, either active asking or consent. So, okay, it's, a, it's okay to intervene. Past that, my feeling is sort of, okay, they, it's their world, they should know better.
you're talking about veterans, you know, re retired veterans, and there's this question of how do you, what's then in the appropriate way, and the, the, the bigger issue, frankly, for all of us in the, you know, who are talking about this is we think sanctuaries are the best way that you retire a dolphin, whether it's been in commercial service or military service. And there, there is indeed a kind of movement on some people talking about trying to find some sites for sanctuaries, but that's the best. Most dolphins you could not effectively reacclimate to the wild. And so in a situation like this, it would seem that Look, you know whether you know a veteran is is human or a veteran is cetacean. You 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 owe them, you owe them for their service. Uh, here's a sort of a prosaic example. Um, on these uh, on these research trips, like the, you know that I, that I've been on. So the main research that Denise Hersing does is observing dolphin social behavior, and it's tracking um, uh, genealogies. She does some work, she's trying to do some work on dolphin, dolphin, dolphin communication, things like that. But you know, most of it's just kind of passive observations. Now she discovered that uh, there were two kinds of interactions that were going on. There were the kind that the dolphins really just wanted her team to stay back. You could watch, but they could, that they'd, you could you know, otherwise you just stay back. But sometimes they liked interaction. So you know, you could get close, you could swim around. They were curious about how good, you know, we were as swimmers. But there were certain signals you'd have to watch for to see whether or not it was one interaction A or interaction B. So I was involved in one of these, and this woman, Becky, one of the swimmers on the team, who had not been out for a few years, missed the, missed the signal. Now, what was going on was there was this mother who was teaching her baby how to fish. And this is an area in the Bahamas where it's about 30 feet deep. It's really clear. And so the mother was trying to, was showing how the baby how to sonar, basically buzz the sand and get one of these little fish to come out and, you know, and, and eat it. So she's trying to teach the baby how to fish. Becky missed the signal that this was a hang back and watch interaction. So she swims down to get a closer look. The baby gets distracted and uh, swims off with Becky. Well, the mother is not very happy. She goes and she swims, she, not that she goes and collects the baby from Becky, she goes and swims in front of Denise, does a tail slap, which is a negative dolphin interaction, does a tail slap in front of Denise, goes and picks up the baby and gets back to work. When we get out of the water, Denise says, I want you to know that what the, what the mother did was she knows that I was in charge. She was telling me, these are your people, this was your responsibility, next time keep your folk in line. So it was, you know, that's communication of a certain sort, but, and there are other ways in which you know, it's, um, as I said, th there are instances where you'll, there are a couple of cases where dolphins are injured. They come seeking help. That's, that's the kind of communication. I've been teaching in business schools for about 25, 30 years. I think that's, that's a, it's a terrible idea. I think that's because corporations uh, do not uh, want, I, I, I think that people, I honestly think people at the tops of corporations should face personal liability. And I think when you, when you do this thing about corporations as being persons, legal, legal persons, uh, for, you, have to, you have to appreciate a, any legislature can make anything a legal person. My toaster could be made a legal person by, by a, I think that's, that's a bizarre notion. And so just because it's a corporation, I think it's a legal, I think it's a legal dodge. So uh, I think the notion of a legal person as opposed to a biological person I just don't accept that idea. Now there are many, there are, there are a number of philosophers who do, who do like the idea. I'm, I may be extreme on this, but I think it's a bad idea. When I first started this work, I was looking for, and this was around the time of the dolphin tuna issue, I was looking for a, um, a way of talking about this with the general public that would be uh, fairly quickly accepted. And I discovered that among most people, the case that I could made, make for personhood, most people were okay with. I knew at that point, though, that there were problems with the concept. And uh, it was a strategic decision, and I hadn't worked out enough about flourishing that I um, 
uh, wanted to you know sort of just ditch personhood altogether. So it it frankly it was a strategic position to try to get the ball rolling in terms of get, getting more support for why dolphins should be seen as as a who, not a what. Now there's there's much greater support for the notion of rights of cetaceans, and um, so now I'm moving you know to a, a more sophisticated but sometimes tougher sell with flourishing. Yeah, nothing's, nothing occurred to me. I'm still trying to work out the, the issue of, of flourishing. The, um, I'm hoping to do another book which will uh, you know, sort of work out the nuances of flourishing, uh, especially since I'm also leaning more towards doing more work on orcas than the smaller dolphins, um, and probably also the bigger whales. So the, the next book I'm toying with would probably Maybe a little more with, with the smaller dolphins, but more with orcas and maybe more with sperm whales. There's some, some interesting evidence as the, about the culture of sperm whales. Uh, obviously, I could not do anything as far as field work on, on that. They're just, but Hal Whitehead has some really interesting research on, on sperm whales. And there's been some great research in the Pacific Northwest on the, um, the lives of orcas, which is already, already out there. And they're, they're under terrible pressure. Uh, environmental pressure and, and all. So. Oh, great question. Yes, this is about moral personhood. Thank you for asking that. I should have, I should have said that. Yes, great question. This is about moral personhood as opposed to legal personhood. Huge difference. Uh, moral personhood is the sort of thing that, as philosophers go, we say grants moral standing. Legal standing is something completely different. Moral standing in the sense that it then means that in a, in, a, in, a, in a moral calculus or calculation, you count. Now, in, in a lot of discussions about environmental ethics, and you see that um, with a lot of sort of conservation biologists, they say, well, species count, or stocks or populations count, but they say individuals don't count. What I'm saying, and, and some of these other scientists say, well, no, no. Individuals should count as well. So conservation biologists will say, the only time you have to worry about things is when a population gets um, squeezed so much that they may not be able to reproduce well, effectively. Or a whole species can go, can, you know, can go extinct. Uh, this is a different argument. This is one that says, you can have a perfectly a healthy population, you can have a perfectly healthy species, but in the same way that we would say of, uh, you know, of us, look, you can have a perfectly, you know, everybody in Toledo may be perfectly healthy, but if somebody in Toledo is being treated poorly, uh, they count as a, you know, as a moral person because they're, you know, they're an individual who counts. So it's, but thanks for asking that because I should have been clear about that. Well, first, if you look at the brain structure of virtually every animal, they're going to feel emotions because you're talking about the limbic portion of the brain. The, uh, the big difference between any animal experiencing emotions of one sort or another and uh, those with self-awareness is the experiencing the self-awareness of the emotion. So humans experience the self-awareness of it. It looks like dolphins have the ability to do that. So yeah, they uh, and I'm and from what I've been told of people who work with elephants, that same deal. They have not only the um, experience emotions, but experience the awareness of it. So there's uh, there's a oh, I'm trying to think of oh the great book uh, title is The Smile of the Dolphin, edited by Mark Beckoff on animal emotions. And there's a terrific piece that Denise has on uh, grief, the dolphin who had uh, lost a uh, you know. A baby, and uh, just terrific story about you know, so the way that Nice re, re, you know tells it. You know this this one dolphin in the off season apparently you know like she and her two friends or three friends had all had babies. The others survived. This one is there, and you know it's like Denise knows. You know she just she lost that that calf, and it's like the whole summer she's grieving. Like the next year she comes back, she has a calf, and things are different. But it's very moving. But the whole book is on stories, stories like that. So, um, it, in a way, it's puzzling that we as you know, that we would wonder about that because when you look at it's like, why would 
animals not have emotions? Because, and this, this becomes kind of, you know, again, a kind of interesting evolutionary issue. Why do, we, why do animals have emotions? We have emotions because it's a fast way to process information from the outside. If a, if a, you know, a boulder were to roll, if, okay, so if I'm here and a boulder were to roll through that door, you know, sort of Indiana Jones style, and I say, aha, a boulder is rolling towards me. Let me see if I can figure out the speed at which it, it'd be much more efficient if I say, holy smoke, a boulder. Emotions are a fast way to process information. And so that's the way mo you know, most, most animals do things. Now, it's not always, well, it doesn't always work, but the default position is, yeah, animals have emotions. Are they aware of them? Not, no, not in, the way, not in the way that we are. Do they feel them? Sure. Do they have memories of them? Not so much as the way that we do. But I don't know that I answered your question well. Well, self-awareness of it, they have then have, it adds to the richness of the inner world. Yeah, but that, you have that, when you have self-awareness, not only are you just kind of aware of the world out there, you have awareness of your inner world, and you're then much more, you're vulnerable not only to physical pain, but to emotional pain. You can be tear, 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 you can be made, made afraid. <laughs> so, yeah, it makes it worse. As I, as I said, it's, Self-awareness is a two-edged sword. I'm told that uh, elephants um, um, a number of the great apes uh, somebody else has passed the done the, the mirror self-recognition. Um, parrots may have. I, I confess that not being a science guy originally, my expertise is really narrow. But it, you know, there's no reason to think it's only going to be humans. And especially when you say, well, we need to look to see what's appropriate in their domain, we stop saying, can you pass our tests? So I, I, expect, there, I expect there are going to be more. And there's no reason why self-awareness would just be out there for one or two and, you know, or three or four. If you started taking out the more detailed ones, it would be you know, a lot, something that's alive, that's aware, that's uh, pleasure and pain, self-awareness. That'd probably be, well, you'd have to have some kind of ability to control your behavior, um, recognize other persons. It'd be interesting to play with. I, uh, I always felt funny about that, uh, but there's the problem of, you know, we're talking about carbon-based life forms. In theory, there, should, there could be other kinds of life forms, and then I don't know what, what does life look like. I mean, in theory, you could have computers, you know, elect, some that, are, that are electronic. Does that, do you need life then? Do you modify that to be something else? If you can have a computer with self-awareness, but you can shut it off and then turn it back on, does that count as? So there's a way in which even person, we, we, we start with something that's biological, and that may be even there as a kind of bias. Yeah, yeah there'd have to be. There'd have, uh, the size, uh, food source, and that, this is the kind of thing people who, I mean, there are people who are actively working in that, in that kind of thing now, and those are some of the questions they're looking at. You know, where can we find something? How big can it be? The sad thing is, it's, it's never going to be, for dolphins and orcas that have been in captivity, it's never going to be everything that they could have. But like protection from predators. If they haven't developed skills to avoid predators, how do you then, can you locate it in a way in which there aren't going to be as many predators? Do you have a backup plan for if, if they can't navigate the hunting their own food? So yeah, it's, it's, it's all those things. and. Um, it would, be, it would be like, you know, for any human who has been confined in a way for so long that they've lost skills, the first thing you'd want to do is see, well, what can you get back? But recognize that you can't get everything back. So I'm sure there's going to be, I mean, I know, I know some of the people who are involved in this and they're, 
it's the, okay, you know, first things first, can we get real estate, can we get ocean, and then it's, it's, it's going to be a big task. But at least 20 years ago, nobody was in a position even to talk about this. So there's, there's, there's progress. Thank you very much. Thanks.